Excuse me, no doubt. Hi guys. Well, it has turned into a cold, gloomy October day in August here at Bugs in a Jar Farm here in the middle of the collapse of everything. And then we have somehow stumbled into Friday, August 18th, 2023. And uh, so I think I'm somewhat recovered from the... Uh, that little oops moment with that moldy carpet last week. I was too sick to do a Manga Bay Roundup rant last Friday. I'm sure you guys were all depressed, but don't worry. I am healthy again. And so before the rain starts drumming on the tin roof here, let me dive right into it and see. We're going over to MangaBay.com. To touch base with Rhett Butler and the boys and girls about what's going on on planet Earth. In the middle of August, we have a rhino farm for sale. The world's largest private rhino herd. You can buy 2,000 southern white rhinos are on the market today. It doesn't say the price per rhino. <coughs> Not one buyer has come forward for the 2,000 rhinos. And considering what, just the horn is worth about $20,000. Anyway, so if you're in the market for a rhino, send me a, an email to collapsechronicles at gmail.com and I will put you in touch with the rhino broker. All right. Imagine this one. I don't know what this first word captive means. Captive to coal, Indonesia to burn even more fossil fuels for green tech. Indonesia is building several new coal-fired power plants for industrial users, meaning not residential users, despite its stated commitment to start phasing out coal and transition to clean energy. Uh, these so-called captive coal plants will have a combined capacity of 13 gigawatts, accounting for more than two-thirds of the 19 gigawatts of new coal power in the pipeline. And guess where the energy is going? I think we covered this two weeks ago. Gee, where do you think the coal-fired energy is going? It will be feeding the nickel, cobalt, and aluminum smelters that the government is promoting in an effort to turn Indonesia into a manufacturing hub for electric vehicles and batteries. Uh, there you go. Critics say the building spree goes against both these green technology aspirations and Indonesia's own climate commitments. Hmm, imagine that. Using fossil fuels to transition away from fossil fuels. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Okay, already, guys, this is why I, I depend on every, every, every week I take my hat off to Rhett Butler for uh, letting us know, you know, his penetrating analysis, particularly of palm oil. This is why we need Rhett Butler. If it wasn't for Rhett, we never would have figured this out on our own. I, I know this is hard, but, but really try to wrap your head around what Rhett's getting ready to say here. Palm oil and pulpwood firms are not doing enough to prevent peat fires. Hmm. More than 5 million acres or 2 million hectares of oil, palm, pulpwood, and other, I love this word, concessions. Concessions means rainforest. That's Indonesian for rainforest is concession across Indonesia are at a high risk of being burned because of companies' failures to restore the peat landscape. 
This represents more than half of the Switzerland-sized area of tropical peatland throughout Indonesia. <coughs> yes. Uh, do, would you believe that researchers are questioning the effectiveness of government mandates and certification schemes, I would call them scams, in preventing peat fires. All right, and we always have to hear from the uh, mythical round table on sustainable palm oil. We're going to have a test. Mythical. What is what is what is the only thing you need to know about sustainable palm oil? It doesn't exist. <laughs> there you go. All right. We have a regular <laughs> listener. One more time. This man understands it, and his name is Pete, no less. Pete understands this. If, if anybody should understand this, it would be someone named Pete. Uh, one more time, guys. Pete, Pete fires. There is no such thing as sustainable palm oil. I don't give a damn what shape the table is. Probably, that table was probably made out of mahogany as a wild guess. All right, here is an article I'm not even going to uh, waste much time on about the Congo Basin's forest elephants. Uh, you can kiss goodbye the Congo <laughs> Basin's forest elephants. I can't believe there is still a forest elephant in the Congo Basin. I've never kissed an elephant. Uh, well, you can kiss this one goodbye. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to skip over the hopium. Uh, a lot of talk about this one. You notice I have not I have not mentioned this story, but this is Manga Bay spin on this. So I guess since everyone else of the Doomosphere is cheering this on, youth youth wins climate case against U.S. state of Montana in first of its kind legal ruling. A landmark ruling <clears throat> found the state of Montana, which is probably one of the cleanest uh, air states on the planet when it's not on fire anyway. The state of Montana violated young people's constitutional rights to a, quote, clean and healthy environment, making the first time a U.S. court has connected the government's fossil fuel promotion with harm to youth from climate change neglect. Uh, we will see what this means. Um, Judge Kathy Seeley, blah, 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 ruled in favor of the young plaintiff, stating that laws prohibiting climate change consideration and fossil fuel activities were unconstitutional. Uh, and there you go. We will see what this means. We will see what uh, the big energy corporations are going to do with 16 teenagers in Montana. Okay, well there's pretty much the story we just talked about. Half coal will use it. Indonesia's climate stance raises questions. Um, well, we just had this uh, story already, uh, so we don't need to repeat it. Okay. We have a question in a Manga Bay headline. There's going to be a test for this man. Uh, okay. Pete Fires. We're going to call this man Pete I, I Fires. Study. Pete Fires. A question. Rhett Butler is asking you personally a question. Top quiz. Can land titles save Madagascar's embattled biodiversity and people? Not by a long shot. There you go. Well, this was a yes or no question. So, so the, the answer to your question Absolutely is no. Absolutely not. All right. This man obviously I has been listening eight. to this rant for 15 years. I got 100 of my tests. Because he knows the answer. The answer to the question, 
can land titles save Madagascar's embattled biodiversity and people? The answer to the question is no, they cannot. Alright, so we don't even need to read the article because we've answered the question. <laughs> Alright, we have the uh, finally, you know, every once in a while, even Donald Trump uh, is right, I, I, I hate to admit it, uh, so this could be, I wish we had Donald Trump sitting in for the, to cover this story. Fair winds or foul, spelled F-O-W-L, clean energy clashes with conservation in Brazil and everywhere else. Brazil is among the top 10 countries in terms of installed capacity for wind power. <coughs> yes, and 85% of the more than 10,000 wind turbines in Brazil are in the Caatinga biome where winds are ideal for energy generation. Yes, as a renewable, cheap and clean energy source, wind has received large investments and favorable changes to legislation to promote the development of more wind farms, sometimes at the expense of environmental licensing procedures. Conservationists such as Donald Trump say the problem is that many wind farms are built in areas of native vegetation that are home to rare bird species which may collide with the turbine blades. Yes, the Lears McCall and the Araripe mannequin both threatened species are among those facing the highest risk of being mowed down by a wind turbine. Good lord. Uh, okay, we have an investigation against a palm oil plantation working in Liberia and Cameroon. The investigation is in, and it has confirmed most of the allegations against the plantation operator. Uh, <clears throat> investigators found credible claims of sexual harassment, land disputes, and unfair recruitment practices. Uh, oh, I guess this was more of a labor dispute than an environmental one. Okay, but now that, let's go from Africa back to the Amazon, back to the Brazilian Amazon. You will not believe this. Five Tembe indigenous activists shot an Amazonian palm oil war. In just 72 hours, five indigenous people were wounded by gunfire and violent attacks in the past few days in a part of the Brazilian Amazon dubbed the Palm Oil War region, sparking outrage. This was just the latest episode in a wave of escalating violence tied to land disputes between indigenous communities and palm oil companies in the region. Uh, there you go. Well, those are the five that they know about in the past week. All right, more hopium. Okay, we have that, a second question. Did you forget about your, the thing you love to smell in the morning? <laughs> Oh, shit, that would have been my uh, my absolute perfect opportunity. I love the smell of napalm oil in the morning. Uh, yes, in the middle of a palm oil war. I love the smell of napalm oil. Thank you, Robert. In Duvall. the morning, yes, I totally forgot. All right. 
uh, we're going to move on from napalm oil to that regular oil. We have another question. See if you can bat 100%. A second question. Okay, Pete Fires. <laughs> yes or no? Can an upcoming referendum in Ecuador stop oil drilling inside Yasuni National Park? Yes or no? No. There you ding, go. Ding, ding, All, ding, right. Ding, ding. All right. You are batting one. Thousand, you are two for two, brother. Do I get a rhino horn? Yes, you get one of two thousand rhino horns. Okay, as Pete Fires just told you, the answer to the question: Can an upcoming referendum in Ecuador stop oil drilling inside Yasuni National Park? The answer to the question is no. It cannot. There you go. Uh, the decision won't be easy for Ecuadorians as oil has been a major driver of economic growth for the country since the 1970s. And also in August, Ecuadorians will also vote on whether or not to allow mining to continue in the Andean Choco Forest. Uh, and for good reason, environmentalists have been... Oh, I read that wrong. I read this. Environmentalists have been fighting the upcoming referendum for nearly 10 years. They're saying environmentalists have been fighting for the referendum. Well, you might, uh, this might be a case of be careful what you wish for. Uh, it is, uh, why, uh, okay, so these environmentalists, uh, we shall see, it just said 10% of, of Ecuador's GDP is from all of this crap, this planet-eating crap, and all of these uh, Ecuadorians, particularly the ones in the city, uh, they're able to buy more and more of this made-in-China crap from uh, this oil being drilled in the Amazon and these minerals being drilled up there in the Andes Mountains. Uh, and I'm guessing 85% of the population of of uh, Ecuador lives in the big cities, particularly. Well, it would be uh, it, it would it would be um, Quito, and then the one the one that's even bigger than Quito, which is an oil town. My guess, I'm going to predict this right now. I'm going to say the equi the the referendums are going to fall and that Ecuadorians are going to vote to keep the planet eating. Uh, and then there you go, that, the, the case is closed. But even if they do uh, vote to stop this planet eating, you, you know, pull your head out of, you, out of your oil well, uh, it ain't going to stop it. So it makes no difference which way the referendum goes. The answer to the question is no. And it very well, uh, these little mainstream environmentalists uh, might, might get a big dose of be careful what you wish for. Uh, okay, so we're getting some reviews in from uh, this Amazon Summit last week. Amazon Summit nations agree on saving the rainforest but not on conservation goals. There you go. So the leaders, they did agree to save the rainforest. Huh, there's one problem. Environmental organiza organizations lament the lack of consensus over zero deforestation targets among the nations and criticize the failure to mention fossil fuel exploration anywhere in the declaration. There you go. Um, and indigenous activists expressed, the noble savages expressed frustrations that no specific goals or targets 
were defined. Okay, let's look at uh, the latest tale of hydropower in the Amazon. We're going... Oh, it doesn't really... Uh, nope, I'm sorry. that You have to click on it to get into that. Okay, here we go. I'm sorry. The oil debt. The oil debt. More than 6,000 polluted sites fester across Amazonian countries. So as the the delegation to save the rainforest never mentioning fossil fuel extraction as a threat to the Amazon rainforest, nowhere mentioned. While that was going on, a joint investigation by Manga Bay and all of these other people uh, were doing their own investigation, although more than 8,000 contaminated, you know, oil drilling sites have been identified by the various governments. Most of them have not been cleaned completely. Yeah, right. Our journalists found forgotten oil pits, contaminated soil, abandoned oil wells, and wetlands covered in crude oil across Amazonian territories. Of course, they would have found the very same thing had they been in, I don't know, Utah. Or had they been over there in Eastern Europe. It's not like this crap is limited to uh, the Amazon rainforest. And you, take, uh, and you take a wild guess why oil drilling was never mentioned in saving the Amazon. Uh, okay, so... Who is Amazon's single largest deforester? This would uh, be a fellow named Bruno Heller. Bruno Heller gets the award single-handedly. He has so far destroyed over 16,000 acres of Amazon rainforest for his cattle ranching an area larger than the island of Manhattan, according to authorities. Uh, the public forests were illegally invaded and then divided up. Uh, areas along the BR-163 highway have long been a target for land grabbers, but the criminal business became more attractive after land prices rose when the highway was fully paved in 2019. I bet. Okay, well, we have some apocalyptimism. Electric vehicles offer climate, huh? Offer climate, huh? EVs offer climate <laughs> hope, but the total auto supply chain revamp is vital. <laughs> hmm. Internal combustion engine vehicles and electric vehicles both have supply chains that generate significant environmental impacts. Do you think so? Um, then they start talking about this uh, this circular economy crap. Uh, unfortunately, if you're a fan of the circular economy and a fan of EVs, the introduction of EVs globally is dependent.